this second uh, series of related programs for the closely considered Deep Learning at Berkeley exhibition. I want to just uh, please make a couple notes um, that you can please turn off for your cell phones. And secondly, uh, the restrooms are around the other end of the building. Just have to make a right a couple times and you'll find them going through the back of the gallery. Um, we are especially pleased to have our guest speaker, Renee Mott, to talk about her relationship and her knowledge and practice working with Richard Dean Coyne, uh, the prints that she produced or worked with at Crown Corn Press and possibly other places. I know she's going to provide a part of the story. But I do want to mention a couple of other upcoming events. Uh, next Sunday is the Big Draw. This is the time when you get to come and draw. This is a, a Champion Dean Corn. It is, it's, it's an international uh, day of the, the Big Draw, and we will have it in our painting studio. It's going to happen across 30 countries around the world, so we're going to try to uh, uh, connect, connect it uh, mentally and physically, and we'll hopefully have a fun time. Also, uh, there on October 9th, on Thursday, if you haven't signed up, we still have a couple spaces for the drawing alongside the Ford's model, which is going to take place here in the gallery. Uh, there's a slight uh, classroom fee. Please check our website, uh, richardartsend.org. And finally, considering the decorum, we have uh, an informal discussion on how Richard did work art teaching and spirit have influenced art and practice with of in the Bay Area for the past 50 years. And finally, we are adding one more note, and I think I'll have Jan Burke talk about, but we'll have a wonderful performance by Dysol. A, is it a quartet? It is a string quartet. String quartet is yeah. going to perform here yes. on November 6th from 5.30 to 7.30. And finally, the last day of the exhibit, please come back, tell your friends, it's the closing party uh, from 5 p.m. Uh, oh, from 3 to 5 p.m. Uh, I also want to acknowledge the sponsors of the exhibition who made this possible. And that is Susan and Steve Chamberlain. Uh, that is also James Curtis, Harry and Margaret Anderson Foundation, Mechanics Bank, Ruin, Ruin, and Associates, William and Catherine Keller, Allegal Toki, and Owen Oakley, and Blake Park Materials. Without their help, uh, this exhibit would not be possible. And we have an exhibition catalog that comes along with this. So wonderfully illustrated as all the images that's in the exhibit by Denny Horn Illustrated, as well as essays by Jan Horn, the guest curator. And it's up to you buy it at the front desk for $25, which includes the tax. So I would like to introduce you to our special guest curator who made who brought this idea to my attention about a year and a half ago and who did an incredible work and job of putting this together. And her thoughts and insights are quite evident in the selections that she picked. That is the jam work. Renee has 
worked with some of the most extraordinary artists in the studio. And she has supported artists in realizing their visions in complex techniques of printmaking. She supported the exhibition and study of prints in museums and cultural institutions. Renee has been a great supporter of, the, of art in, in the Bay Area. She does not always wear that sign and film the intact, but she is a great supporter of the arts. And she has generously loaned her own uniforms to this exhibition. It is a great pleasure to have Renee Bach here with us at the Richmond Art Center to share her experiences and to give us some insight into what it meant to roll up your sleeves with Richard Thank you so much. Worked 
about this particular print, which was the first encounter you had with him, he had already had a working relationship over the years, and he um, was actually working in Los Angeles at the time, wasn't he, when he worked on that? Well, I was he going was back in Vegas. I think he was in Healdsburg. He was already in Healdsburg. I'm pretty sure he was, yeah. But um, one of the things that, that, um, that I read from his interviews is that he was very um, eager for change, always, and that he saw um, living in different places in Northern California, Albuquerque, um, Urbana even, <laughs> um, and, and, and Los Angeles and back up north, that each each of these change, each of these moves brought change to the work that he embraced, that he was always happy to see where it would lead and how it would develop. So I'm not surprised that he was happy to see what working with a new young printer would do. <laughs> well, also I, I noticed that, I mean, I, worked, I had the fortune of working with him at both uh, the Crown Point Press in, in downtown Oakland. I started when they were still there. And then um, we moved to the Folsom Street studio, which was absolutely gorgeous. And he did a couple projects there. And I was not so involved in those projects at that time until much later. Um, it was 1989, and he, um, his health was up and down during those years. And we had a lot of projects going on at Crown Point. It was a very, very busy time those years. And uh, he was in the hospital, and Captain went to go visit him. And he requested that a couple of little soft ground plates be brought to him. And that was something that he could do while he was spending his time waiting to recover, basically, in the hospital. And so Captain had a bunch of uh, printers make small plates. They were probably 9 by 12, or you know, the size of a sheet of paper. And um, we rolled them up and made special little cardboard boxes for them and sent them. And then Captain brought them to him in the hospital, and he did uh, an etching that was published called Tulips. And it was a drawing of the tulips that were on his bedside table at the hospital. And when you look at that print, you can see, first of all, what a master at drawing this man was. But you can also feel the tenacity of his mark, and it is a very emotional and touching piece. I don't know if the people that print know the story behind it, but it is one of the more personal um, etchings that I saw him do that. To me, it felt so much about a statement about where he was when he did that drawing. Um, his health improved, and then the earthquake struck. <laughs> and the earthquake shook Crown Point out of the Folsom Street studio, which had been a magnificent, beautiful gallery of sure. Some of you saw it, but so we we had to be re relocated, and for a while the printers were working in the East Bay and some in the city, and they had to find a temporary place for the gallery, and it was really a chaotic time. But Captain found a temporary garage space to put all the printers in so that we could work together. And in that that year, she asked me to create the six etchings that are here on display. Um, the six little plates that were created for the Yates book that was published by Arian Press. So those six etchings actually were bound into the books that Arian Press does on the poetry of Yates. And I, I think it was probably published in 1990 or 89, but we did those prints in 89. And that was the beginning of my four-year relationship with Dick, where he would come and go and we would work on prints. And sometimes he'd only come and work for a couple days, but um, so we got to know each other very well. But making those little plates, it was really a, a really wonderful time because I remember Catherine said, "Renee, will you um, go make you know work with Dick over the weekend and make these plates?" And see, this was a project that she was not publishing, so she really didn't want to tie up the press with a lot of time spent during regular printing hours. So I went in on the weekends and I worked with him on these. And so it was just me and him. And we were in this temporary space. And the temporary space was literally a garage with fluorescent lighting. It was very dark and dank and miserable. <laughs> it was miserable. <laughs> and uh, it was, 
you know, right after the earthquake, we took what we could find. And meanwhile, Calvin was very busy trying to find a new home for the whole press. So the office was in a downtown office building basement, and we were in this garage down on Folsom Street, probably between 6th and 7th. And um, it ran a city block, but it felt like we were in a cave. It was so dark. We didn't have any windows. It was just one long cave. And um, there were rats. And the rats were everywhere. <laughs> and they just sort of skittered over the, you know, across the pipes. And, and, you know, we initially working there were very excited about the rats, but then we realized, oh, they just got shook up like we did. They're just looking for a new home. <laughs> so one day we're sitting around, all the printers that are there, Catherine's there, I'm there, Dick's there. We're eating lunch on like a slow coffee table. And suddenly a rat skitters by over our head, and everybody's just quiet. And we're just praying that he hasn't noticed anything. Of course, I could do not. And then he just kind of goes, was that one of our furry friends? <laughs> <laughs> and we just all laughed so hard. It was just, we were in it together. It was just such this comic moment of relief. And, and even though it was kind of a day dark place, it, he brought so much light to it and um, created those beautiful edgings. And it was really a very special time. Probably more special because of the chaotic sort of circumstances that we were in. Um, it, it, go ahead. Can I just, I, ha I have a question about um, these particular pieces, which are very emotional and, and quite moving. Um, but they're also, um, very sequential in the way they evolve, the image evolve, evolves. And um, I was wondering if um, if he had a clear um, decision from the very beginning from plate one through plate six, and he already knew that he was going to come with the maps at the end. Did he know that he was going to have the shroud aspect of the of the of the of the I do know the he, bag covering it and then revealing it. He, he read the poem to me, the one that mentions the code. Yes. And, um, and so it, it's interesting that you ask that. Very often, working with artists, you, at least as a printer, your um, process of working with them is a form of discovery that doesn't involve explanation. And I find that very often I am involved in an artist's process, but not necessarily saying, well, why did you do that? I mean, that's not the conversation that we have. It's more like, do you, do you want to flat bite that? He'll say, I want to make that a little hazy. How would I do that? And I say, well, what about flat biting it? You know, very technical, but in a way you're having a very intimate conversation about creating an image, but not necessarily, why, why are you drawing coats? You know, he did read the poem to me. And I did ask him about the map, and he said, well, naturally, because Yates is from Ireland, so. And I was like, oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, um, but there was one other really touching moment um, about making those plates, which was we took the prints, so the plates were made in that space, and then we printed what are called the bonatire or okay prints. And then they were, the plates and the prints were handed over to Andrew Coyne because he wanted to print the edition to put in his book. So Dick and Phyllis invited me up to their Healdsburg home for lunch and um, for the trading off. And, and so Dick and Phyllis were there, I was there, their two dogs were there, and Andrew Coyne and his wife were there. And we started off with this kind of amazing lunch. I think we got there at 11.30 and there was white wine and Phyllis had made this amazing salmon. And we were sitting outside and I just thought, oh, I could live here. <laughs> I'll just move in. And, um, and then after lunch, you know, I got to know him a little bit. I had never met him really. I mean, I had talked to him several times during that project, but I had never actually got to know him. And he was very funny. Um, so I showed the prints. I had a little portfolio and I tied it and I and Dick, well Dick said, can you show Andrew the prints? And I was so surprised that he was handing that task over to me. They were his prints. 
but suddenly he was including me in this way, and I was, you know, 25, 26, I was a little older probably, but it just felt so wonderful to be given that recognition. So I remember I untied the portfolio and laid it open, and we all sort of, it was quiet, and I just turned the prints over one by one, and waited, and everyone looked, and then, you know, we got through the six images. It was only six images, but no one said a word the whole time. And, um, and then I tied up the package, and I gave it to Andrew Coyle, and I gave him the place, and then it was time to leave, and I got up to leave, and Dick put his hand on my shoulder, and he said, I really liked the way you did that. <laughs> <laughs> and I just couldn't even believe how I just was filled with such joy that um, he, had give, he had just given me so much respect and, and included me so much in, the, in that whole uh, process. And that was the kind of person Dick was. He, he was just very humble and um, grateful for those people in his life. And it was just really special. It was a special moment. Can I ask a question? Sure. Um, you were getting more something then. Print in addition. Yes. Yeah. 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 And um, yeah, it was just—it was kind of like a little ceremony because Dick had made the place with Crown Point, but then, you know, they, they, everything was getting handed over to another uh, publishing house so that they could make the additions. So, like giving up the baby. Yeah, a little bit. <laughs> The book is beautiful. I don't know if anyone's seen it, but it's absolutely gorgeous. So they wound up a really wonderful location. So it's, we, we, we have somebody who actually. Um, the way that those etchings were made is that all of them are multiple dips into the acid, so that he was working on all of them at the same time. The one thing that I do remember is that the map came last. That was the very last thing he did. But all the all the plates were being created at the same time, and we may have created more that just got jettisoned. I I, I don't have a clear memory of whether we were just working on those six. I there, I do know that we started a whole body of small works like we and Nukon Pompa and Window and the, all those little plates got going at that same time, but we didn't have time to finish them. And those were that was later. I, I think one of the, the things and why I was asking originally about the sequence is that um, it's almost like when you read a poem and you are already anticipating the last lines. You're already in music, you already know how the melody is going to progress. And I think that's what happens when you see these six pieces, or certainly the first five, that you you're looking at the first and you know what's going to happen. Code and you know it's going to dissolve into drag, and you know that it's going to show time and loss and emptiness, and you know how that, that covering up is going to happen with the garment bag. It, that's why it feels as if it were all plotted out, and um, it, it has a true sense of where it's going. I think Dick very often approached his abstract work from a figurative base, so it makes sense that he would, you know, I mean, actually, um, from the, from that, if you look at the, so the very last one that's sort of shrouded that we're talking about, um, was the genesis for the prints that we did in 1990, um, Domino 1 and Domino 2, very similar. Um, so I think that he did do that, he would take um, a composition that was based on something figurative, figurative and move it into the abstract. And, um, but it's interesting when you're working with an artist here, as a printer, you're not analyzing it that way. It's just more about trying to get into their mind to understand where they want to take the image. And so everything becomes very individual. And so when you're working, for when I was working on that first code, for instance, it's a very literal drawing of a coat, hard ground line, 
You know, it was like knowing when to, you know, ask him, is this black enough? Do you need more hard ground? So, it, like I said, it's, it's the process of working with artists. You're just trying to get into their mind to know what it is that they're going to need next, and when is it finished, and do I need to say anything? <laughs> like, is there anything I need to say? I mean, often, our conversations were, um, you know, around the lunch table, were very, very, very normal. You know, did you see that Masterpiece Theater thing last night? You know, that kind of thing. Or, How are your dogs? And so, I, we didn't have conversations about art, but I used to be very amazed at watching his process. He was the only artist in all the time I worked at Crown which was 11 years, that I saw use the mirror in the way that he did. And um, the way he would tear things and pin them to the work on the wall, it was incredible to watch because his hands, um, okay, well, I noticed people's hands. Like, when there's an artist in the room, you can tell by the way, like, even the way they might undo a buckle. There's something about the way that they move their hands. One thing I want to say about Dick's hands is that he was weirdly clumsy. And, <laughs> you know, like I noticed that there was a weird clumsiness to it. That was so graceful, it was breathtaking. It was like the two sides of one coin. It was, but of course, I, I was working with him when he was, you know, it was uh, not his younger years. So, um, but I, I remember being um, fascinated by watching the way he worked. And, you brought up the women at G's Bend. Um, there's sort of a, when you're working in the presence of a master, there, there's a greatness that enters the room. And I honestly felt that with Dean Martin. Like, there was something so much bigger than all of us in that room. But he was it. He was the greatness. And, um, I, I really rarely feel that. I mean, I wish I could feel it with every artist I work with. I definitely try to get there, but when you're in the presence of a master like that, it, and because of who he was, being so humble. Um, the, and, the, and another time I felt that was working with the women of G's Bend. There is something about the purity and truth of their work that doesn't involve talking about it. It's just experiencing it, being there, seeing it being, understanding what, where they're going, you know, that kind of thing. Well, one, one thing uh, which I find really um, interesting with, um, with, with Dick this morning is that, you know, it's, it's such a, a process and he's pushing all the time, but it's not because he doesn't know. I mean, he knows and um, and I, I also think it's very interesting because he's talked about not wanting to, to fall back on certain things that you know are going to work and are easy to do and always pushing. But nonetheless, it's all guided by something that's something internal, some, some incredible um, strength and understanding and, and, and knowledge um, that he sometimes is working against, but it's, it's always there. Um, and one thing about um, the garment bag that comes to mind when I see it also, just in terms of shape. I think it's, you know, I look at his work, I'm always thinking about, his thinking about shape, is um, that the work that Batista in Morocco has this arabesque, it has that structure, it has the architecture, which holds and contains. It always opens up to an incredible expanse and a change in light, but it also contains in a very beautiful way Without losing energy, because of that era, it's the same shape as the heart and that I was thinking about. Right. Dick, I feel like um, another thing about him was that the environment, I started to talk about this, but lost the thread, and you brought it back because of uh, mentioning Matisse. Um, Dick's work often did have the name of the location, like Folsom Street series, or um, so. His work definitely was affected by the light, by the space, by the room, by the people. The work that he created was about the place that he was in. And um, he created the domino images. Um, I, I'm sorry, I don't have the, the slides to show you, but they're very similar to the final code 
image over there. Um, and it was in the Crown Point Press um, current gallery, where they are now, and the windows were covered with ivy. And they are beautiful windows, but they're divided light, very big, sort of metal frame windows, and all this ivy was growing in front of it. And you can just feel that by looking at these prints, that he was in this room, very green room with ivy, and you, you know, arching over the windows, and they were, I think the windows, you know, they just felt like they were arched at the top, and that's what these prints were about. A very sensitive print that he made, um, Touched Red, over there, is one of my favorite prints. Um, it's really shocking, because there's a shocking pink soft brown under everything, and I just was always surprised by Dick. He, he was willing to work with the shocking pink. <laughs> And literally, this was my 
third month working there, and I would wipe that plate, and it would be the first plate printed. And if I had made a mistake, everyone would see it. <laughs> and I remember, I did make a few mistakes, and uh, Marsha came up to me and she said, Renee, you can't make that mistake. You just can't make that mistake. She goes, either, either, either you do it or you don't, and you're not doing it. And I just remember, oh, she's so right. I have to remember to wipe out that line every time. And I think that that moment was the moment I realized, oh, well, if I'm going to be a printer, then I need to not forget, you know, sort of like being young and understanding the difference between what a printer does in a school versus being a professional printer. I mean, there were all these little experiences that take you there so you remember not to forget. And that was one of those moments. But it wasn't when Dick was standing there. That was during the auditioning. So, um, auditioning always happens when the artist is not there because it takes a long time to pull the audition. That was a big addition. One question about that. Uh, 
horizontal, and it's just black lines on the white ground, um, thick black lines. And um, he saw that. I pulled a drawer open, and he saw it, and he's like, wait a minute, what's that? And I pulled it out, and he said, well, I don't know what's wrong with that. <laughs> and he just signed it. And so then we printed the edition. But he had started that play, you know, many, many years before, before my time. So I thought that was great. And then um, often he would jazz in plays so that didn't work. I mean, he what he did like was getting a play really mucked up with marks, and then he'd give it to us printers and say, scrape it all out. And so, and, and you know, drum tool was very efficient at scraping things out in copper. But oh no, we'd sit there with a scraper and scrape it out. Because he liked the way that the scraper left a mark. And, um, but yes, he often had many, many things going on, but not everything got used. And uh, I think some of the most peculiar prints he made were the, the two in the back there, the barbarian garden threatened. And, and that was really towards the end of his time working at the press, and um, I do think they reflect a certain chaotic feeling that he was having in himself about mark making and you know what those marks meant. Yeah, you know, it was definitely a, a difficult time. It was hard for him to work at that point. So he'd work and then go lie down and then come back into the studio and work again. Who but, owns the place? Publisher owns the plates, so Crown Point Press owns the plates of every print made there. She probably has them in the archive. Um, the code plates belong to Aaron Press because I'm pretty sure he published it, so they belong to him. Um, some plates get canceled, but I doubt any of his got canceled. I mean, what I mean by that is they get, you know, sold for scrap back to the copper company. Um, but if, if they're kept for the archive, usually a little corner's cut off the plate to, to cancel it. I, I'd like to um, talk a little bit about Barbarian. And um, because it, the, those two prints that we have here in the back, they're so radically different in terms of how he handles space. His visual vocabulary is so different. It, it's, it's really, really... Um, Startling. When I first saw those at Crown Point a couple of years ago, um, I, I really started rethinking a lot of things, actually. And I was, I was wondering if, while you worked on that with him, he was talking about um, his earlier period of looking at expressionism. And, and if we go back to the early figurative um, period, certainly in terms of working with symbols, but. Um, just the, this change really is, I, I've never seen this in any of his work, with um, having all of the activity around all of the edges and having an open central field like that. And did he talk about anything that he was looking at or thinking about? At the time? I think that those images were as much a surprise to him as they were to us. Um, he was using a technique called soap ground, and soap ground's very hard to gauge as an artist when you're working with it because it's what happens very often is that a painter will get really um, enamored with the way that it goes down. You, you paint it on with a paintbrush and it feels like thick white paint. But what you're doing when you lay that soap ground down is you're covering up the copper. And very often artists who work with soap ground end up covering the whole plate because they just get so enamored with that soap. <laughs> And they like playing with it. And that's what he did. He pretty much covered the whole plate. And then he um, started script taking it away. And what I saw when he was making the plates initially was, wow, this really reminds me of this very early space. And um, that sort of, those shapes that I think you have some of them. We, we, have, some, we have a very early, yeah. very early drawing hanging yeah. by the very late print. That's, yes, very similar shapes yes. to that. But um, I think it was the nature of the soap ground that made that space so different. And I think it was the first time that he really used it and just played with it for a whole afternoon. And then there was also, um, there's also this thing in printmaking that happens where you introduce an artist to a medium and suddenly that's all they want to do. Like, they get sort of hung up on that, oh, the soap ground is fun. I, just do that over and over again. 
And at the same time that he was doing the soap round, we, we printers had, had figured out how to do a thing called a reversal. So um, that's what those images are comprised of there. He made soap round blade, we made a reversal of it, sort of just back and forth, back and forth. And he got um, interested in that, you know, taking, making a negative or a positive of a plate. And, um, and I, that's where those went. I think that those images, there were a total of three of them. One of them is called Plotsam and Jetsam, and then there's Barbarian's Garden and Barbarian's Garden Threatened. We're all about that reversal technique and so far. And I think, uh, the reversal technique would be that you would uh, take an, any image that has any image on a copper plate, print it on a piece of paper, put down a new copper plate, offset the ink onto that plate, and what you get is just this black, sticky ink on the copper plate. And what we do with that ink, we take it off and we rub um, very carefully, dust it with rosin, and the rosin will stick to the ink and create a lockout. So wherever the line was on one plate, you'd get a resist on the other plate, and you can make basically a complete negative um, image. And at one point, I think he was going back and forth with those images, doing that. And I know that we and Ne Comprends Pas were a way that way. So they're a reversal of each other. Um, there are some photos here of me working with Dick. These, this was during Touch Red, actually. Um, in the studio, and and then in this photo, which is extremely dark, um, I can pass them around. That's me and my business partner Pam Paulson working in the Crown Point studio. It, 
I always felt like there was a direction from the beginning. And even though it was a journey, and it literally was a journey, I always felt like he knew where it was going to go eventually. And it wasn't like it was predetermined. It's very hard to explain. It just was getting there. And for some artists, that possibility that you're talking about ends up being a exhausting thing for the printers because you because you can do it. I really love you you, you mentioned price because I have him on here. I wanted to ask you a question about price. A lot of people here don't know Bill Rice and he was um, just as important to do the corn as all of these other artists here where they were very close friends. Rice um, lived in Los Angeles and taught at UCLA also. Um, um, how did he come to work with, with PowerPoint? I'm sure it was through Dick. Through Dick. But he was a very different experience. He was, I mean, literally, I loved his work. He was the son of Fanny Bryce, by the way. And um, he was a very tall man, and he liked um, martinis that had a hot chili pepper in it. So that was the first time I'd ever tasted that. That was interesting. But uh, no, he, he was uh, open to all possibility. In the end, his work always felt like it was Bill Bryce's work. I mean, there was no doubt about it. That was a Bill Rice piece, and he made beautiful work. But um, yeah, he had to see it in every color, and so <laughs> after a while, the master printer in charge would be saying to anyone who'd say, well, "What about if we tried?" <laughs>
You know, that's also an interesting question. Some artists are interested in paper, and they make it, it, it usually surfaces right at the beginning. Like someone like John Cage would come in, and the conversation would start with what paper. But um, David Corn wanted to work, you know, and he didn't, he'd, he'd say, well, I, yes, paper was always part of the conversation, but it was more like I want it to be on a white, or I think I want it on that beautiful Reeves lightweight, which has this color that's on, it's like what touch reds on. Um, so often the color of the paper would be something that it would be concerned about. Um, he loved the Reeves paper because it wasn't pure white. But then green was done on white because maybe because it, it was what was available. That was 60 inches wide. Um, I think it works for the print. Uh, but he, I don't know how involved he was in saying, I want it on a white piece of paper. Maybe it was just printed on that way. And once, once an artist starts seeing something being printed that way, they start to, they either will reject it right away and say, get me a different paper, or they say, oh, that works. You know, let's just stick with that. So, I mean, that was a big project, and it took a long time. So I think that to change paper, you know, that's not, <laughs> you know. <laughs> and Sure. Um, 
He started working with Kathleen early on. I don't actually know the first time they worked together, but Kathleen had a uh, studio in her basement of her house, which was in Berkeley, and they used to work at doing, um, they had a drawing session, and a live model would come in, and people would draw on copper plates, and uh, do you know when that was? The first, uh, that, that preceded the first, uh, preceded the first portfolio. The first portfolio was 1966. So that was just Oh, just before that, 1966. So I didn't really say that. And I know he did the 42 <coughs> etchings. Are those from 1966? Okay. So, um, and then he'd come and go. He made prints with uh, Gemini, and then a couple of the Spade um, projects at Crown Point, and then he did two projects in Japan with them. And, right? and also, we have an earlier print that he did with Joe Zerker here, a lithograph from that predated his working with Catherine. Right, and I think um, uh, lithos are really different than etching. Um, people who love et etching rarely really love litho as themes, <laughs> and Dick loved etching, so I mean, that was really great, because it really appealed to him. He liked the physical aspect of being able to um, scrape and burnish into the copper plate, and it having its own mark, and that really appealed to him. There was a history and, you know, if you, if you made a mark and then you took it away, it left a history. And he loved that, that um, an actual physical history of the plate was really rewarding. Um, and then I think the reason that he made more prints later on is because there were four of us in the room, you know, running around, <laughs> helping him. And he was diminished in his um, stamina. I mean, and towards the end, he was more tired, definitely. So maybe that's part of it. He also moved to Berkeley. Um, he split his time between Kingsburg and Berkeley and was a lot closer than being in LA and having to come up for projects. So well, part of it's circum circumstantial. And part of it, I think, was just loving the group of being, being in the studio and working with people. It's a very different. In the last like, 10 or 15 years, it's like when you say, it was in the last 10 or 15 years of his life, sounds like really working with him until the end of his life. Yes. Um, very, was, so how much of that work during those last two decades was the, uh, was um, Prince? printing and how much was painting and drawing? Um, I mean, I'm not asking for I specifically don't know. Really do you think he was doing it like a half, most of it half the time? Or? No, no. I mean, projects were um, like once a year. Ah, okay. Yeah, it wasn't like all, full time. He's sort of trying to learn just how it fits in the artist's genre. Yeah. <laughs> you were just doing the printing when he came to you. Yeah. I mean, working with plates and creating plates. Only then, yes. Only then. He wouldn't take them home. The only time he took the plate uh, home was when he was in the hospital and did the tulips. That was the only time. Um, I might be wrong on that. Catherine would certainly know every ins and outs of that, but that's what I remember. The, the problem with making plates is that you need to etch them, unless it's a dry point. And so, if you're gonna put a, if you need the acid, you, you want that in a place that's safe and ventilated, and, you know. Well, did he walk in with a sketch or something in his mind? he was Not usually. Not usually. Yeah. What's the arrangement between this printmaking studio and the artist in terms of selling the prints? That sounds uh, like, okay, so have you been to the Italian restaurant down the street and the French restaurant up the street? It's a, every shop does it differently. Um, Crown Point Press uh, does it, uh, we modeled our business after Crown Point pretty much, which is that the artist gets 10 art sprues of everything they do. I'm sorry, five art sprues of everything they do. The press gets five and then the edition is printed and sold. Um, in, in, in Crown Point's case, I'm pretty sure that they give a third of each sale to the artist, and that's what we do at Paulson. So, um, but every press is different, and every artist is different. Some artists will say, I don't want you to sell my prints to a dealer because a dealer will get a discount. Uh, I want you to only sell it, you know, this way. Um, Demoncorn, artists like Demoncorn hardly ever cared about that, you know what I mean? That's the beauty of a great artist, is that they're concerned about the art more than the, the business side. <laughs> and what got you into uh, 
you just got, you, you just graduated from college, college with a printmaking degree. Were you planning to become a teacher or a printmaker or artist, and then you got into printmaking work for other artists? So. I, I like telling the story. Um, I was in eighth grade, ninth grade, and I, I loved to draw. And I had a art teacher who I can't remember his name, but he had a handlebar mustache, you know, big long. He was a Texan. I grew up in Boston. And uh, he said, you know, we ought to go down to the hardware store and get a piece of tin. So I, I did. And then he coated it with hardware and gave me a needle.